All right, everyone. So uh, I just want to give a little intro video to our next segment of classes, and that's going to be on democracy, this theme of democratization, more and more people having a say, getting a vote in America, and what that meant, because certain people were left out, and it also entailed growing tensions and instability that ultimately leads to the Civil War. And to focus, to harness our focus on this, this topic, uh, we're going to do what most historians do. They tend to focus on the presidency of Andrew Jackson. In fact, this era, era is often called the Jacksonian era or Jacksonian democracy. Uh, and it entails more than just Andrew Jackson himself. He kind of represents a lot of trends that were going on in America. <clears throat> just like Trump today, President Trump often is seen as a figure, a controversial figure in and of himself. Uh, but many political scientists and historian argue that Trump is a representation or a symptom of a lot of trends going on in America today. Uh, Andrew Jackson could also be seen as a, a result of trends that were going on in America. So to do this, for this video, we're going to ask the question, how did Andrew Jackson become president? Because by a lot of measures, you know, he's sort of unbecoming or unbefitting of, of a president. So <clears throat> Jackson, a little bit about Jackson. He's born into poverty in the West. So far, all of our presidents up to this point were uh, born and raised in the East, um, in more urban centers, uh, had a fairly elite education, were very, very wealthy. You could argue the aristocrats of society. Andrew Jackson, he's wealthy. He has, owns a big plantation and slaves by the time he's president, but he's not born into that kind of wealth. <clears throat> he's a notorious Indian killer. I mean, he's like famous, infamous for for like, killing Indians wholesale, slaughtering them. Um, he invaded territories against presidential orders. Before he was president, he was a general in the military. He would completely disobey orders and go into different territories and, 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 and invade and kill British, Spanish, Native Americans in, in Florida and that area. Um, he was known for killing many people in duels. Like he would challenge people in duels and he'd kill them, right? And our, the other, his opposition used to call him a murderer and they weren't that wrong. Um, when he was president, he'd often ignore Congress or he'd ignore the Supreme Court doing the opposite of what they said. Um, he, while he was president, threatened to hang his vice president from the nearest tree. Uh, at one point in his presidency, he fired his entire cabinet, uh, his advisors. He, his, most historians agree whether they support him or not, that his economics, his economic policies completely wreaked havoc on, on the society. And when he was, after his two terms, uh, his policies caused the worst economic depression of, of American history up until the Great Depression in the 1920s. Um, he, it was known, the, the 1840s were known as the Hungry 40s because of his policies in, in the 1830s. So how did he become president? Well. In order to understand where Jackson comes from and how he becomes uh, president, we have to understand what's going on and the trends going on in the 1820s up to the 1850s. Now, Jackson is elected in 1828, so we're not gonna get to the 50s yet, but we're gonna, we're talking about these trends. Um, so the backdrop is the leading up to President uh, Jackson is, we talked about Jefferson and Madison. These guys were Democratic Republicans. We didn't talk about Madison too much, but we talked about Jefferson and how he represented this kind of common man democracy against the Federalists. And that, that's, that begins this trend we're talking about. Um, in between them, we have the War of 1812, which is kind of this ill-fought war where we basically tie with Britain. But because we didn't lose to the big mighty Britain, we call it our second war of independence. We're all kind of pumped. And it leads to an era of nationalism and feeling pretty good about America. Um, some historians call this the era of good feelings because in the 18 teens up to the 1820s, we have what is called the, um, the era of good feelings where there's one political party and there's really not too much political wrangling going on, although it's debated uh, in many circles. Um, um, and so there's a trend in many states in the 18 teens to give the common man more say. States across the country were having conventions, constitutional conventions, to lower the property requirements or getting rid of the property requirements to vote. So if you were a white male who sometimes just say paid taxes, you then became able to vote, eligible to vote. Um, ironically, or maybe because of this, we're gonna see, we'll examine this closer, um, as more and more white men got the right to vote, uh, they closed the door to women and African-Americans. Uh, in fact, some states actually allowed for African-American men to vote, um, but uh, as they expanded the suffrage, they call it the vote to, to white men, uh, they defined voting rights as a whites only uh, proposition. A lot of reasons for this, but we'll get into it later, but ironically, the average person of color actually got got the door barred to them. So there's a trend to give them the, the, the average white common man uh, the right to vote. 
Um, and this is what ushers in the aid of democracy, particularly for white men and people like Andrew Jackson. Um, so to reiterate, women, African Americans, and Native Americans remain left out of this system, and we're going to see movements to get them included from them uh, in this time period as well. Now, where did this come from? There's numerous tensions going on in the country in the early 1800s. Uh, after the Panic of 1819, we have thousands of farm foreclosures. Through no fault of their own, many people borrowed money to, to get little farms, to get land. And when a panic happened, they actually couldn't sell stuff anymore. They couldn't sell their farm products. And so they couldn't pay their mortgages and they ended up in debt, losing their farms, often ending up in what's called debtor's prison. So you, back then you could be put in jail for not being able to pay your bills. Um, we also have the increase of factories, not massive factories like we have today, but more and more uh, workshops and manufacturing. And these conditions were bad. So a lot of the working class people began to feel left out as well in the cities. Um, in the South, you have the non-slave owning class versus the planter class. The, about 1% of the super elite rich owned slaves. The majority of whites in the South did not own slaves. And so the planter class, the slave owning class often was viewed upon like the rich elites. And so there was frustrations among poor whites. Um, you have farmers set up against land speculators and banks. Land speculators are wealthy investors who buy tons of land and then sell it at high prices to farmers to try to make a buck. Banks lend money so farmers can pay these land speculators and the banks expect interest back when they get their loans back. So they make money off the farmers. So the farmers are feeling they're, they're getting, uh, they're getting kind of messed over by, by wealthy land speculators and bankers. Um, there's also revolutions going on in the economy. The economy's changing and a lot of average people are kind of losing out of that. And so Jacksonianism or this movement for the common average kind of poor white guy uh, grew out of these tensions. And you could argue that today we're seeing some of these trends too. Our economy has changed in the last 20 years. A lot of people feeling left out. Uh, President Trump definitely played on white, particularly white male resentment. And Jackson definitely plays on that as well. Now, we talked about the economy getting more, or the country getting more democratic. How was it getting more democratic? So specifically, many states uh, extended suffrage rights, voting rights to more people. Um, you had more and more positions that became elected positions. So like sheriffs and uh, attorney generals and, and a lot of other like town officials became elected officials who had to answer to the people. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, many political candidates from governors, senators, and presidents uh, were picked by convention rather than caucus. A caucus is basically a small group of kind of party elites who get together and say, hey, this guy will be our presidential candidate. A convention is you have a vote of people from all the states who, who pick the Democratic candidate, who pick the Republican candidate. So it's more Democratic, it's more participation going on. Um, the presidential electors that goes for the Electoral College, uh, they became elected by the people in many states instead of just a small group of like elites in the government. Um, many new constitutions were drafted. They completely revamped their constitutions, many state, state constitutions. Uh, and they had more liberal constitutions in the sense that it let the average uh, male vote. You didn't have to own a ton of property anymore. So the kind of poor average person got the right to vote. Again, leaving out a women and African Americans and certainly an Native American as we'll see soon. And the working class is getting bigger. Working class in the sense that they're working, they don't own their farm, they don't own their land. They go to a boss to do a job and they get paid by the hour, by the wage. That's a new class in America, a wage worker. Uh, and so these people don't have a lot of power or that much money. And so they often join forces with the frustrated people who want more say in government. So you have a growing mass of people who are kind of left out of the economy. They don't, they're, they're barely surviving and they don't have a voice. They're, they don't have a vote. So through protests, through frustration, there's a movement and a trend to give the average person more say so they can fix their problems. Uh, and more and more of these average people are living in the West. And as we expand West, which is a whole other trend we'll talk about, um, there's more and more votes coming from the West. And so we're gonna see a growing influence of the West. So <clears throat> contrast all of this, the kind of average poor white male um, feeling on the edge, like just kind of eking out a living. Um, in Washington, we have the proposal of what's called the American system, which was proposed by a senator from Kentucky, Henry Clay. You're gonna see Clay's name a lot. The American system was a three-part thing. One, it proposed a protective tariff. This is a tax on all goods coming, or certain goods coming in from other countries, imported duties, they call it, imported taxes. This was meant to help manufacturers compete with foreign imports. If I am making textiles, clothing in Lowell, Massachusetts, all right, uh, but I also have England, English goods coming from factories in England, that's hard for me to compete, and my business could go under, under 
water, right? So um, the a tariff is meant to tax the English goods coming in, so people will buy mine. The English stuff will be more expensive, and I can keep my prices up enough that I can make ends meet and keep hiring more workers um, and survive. So import tariffs are meant to protect factories in America. The problem is it makes the goods a little bit more expensive, uh, and it also tended to favor <clears throat> the, where the factories were, which tended to be in New England. It made things very expensive for the average farmer who's buying the clothes or buying the farm machinery. So they have to pay more money and they feel like they're paying money to wealthy company owners in New England. Whereas you have the average farmer in the South and the West who's feeling ripped off by this, right? The other thing the American system proposed was a second bank in the United States, which with which uh, uh, to keep the tax money, the government would keep the tax money in this bank in the United States, but it was a private bank still. And these bankers would often lend money out to their friends and it, it, it had a huge impact influence. The Bank of the United States also lent money out to people who needed to borrow money to, you know, buy land in the West. But these, they, but these poor farmers had to pay the bank back plus interest. And so when they couldn't pay their bills back, they were very frustrated at this bank that they saw as kind of sucking the blood of the farmers and enriching themselves off the backs of the poor. Um, the other thing the American system uh, proposed, which was a little more popular among people in the West, was internal improvements. Henry Clay said the federal government, not just the states, should pay for internal improvements like uh, canals, roads, bridges, to get the country kind of bound together as one big country. Um, and this was actually fairly popular with people out in the West because it, it allowed them to get their farm goods to cities where they could sell their goods. Um, but Jacksonian dem Democrats, or uh, this democracy, Jacksonians would largely oppose the tariff and the bank as a tool of the rich. And so more and more people flocked to the Jacksonians, to Andrew Jackson and people who were against the American system. And they became the heroes of the common person, the masses. So flash forward 1824, President Jackson's running for president. But he loses to this guy. <clears throat> this is John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, and it's what has been known as the corrupt bargain of 1824. Now, this is super relevant because right now we have President Trump who's arguing that the election was stolen from him. Now, I'm going to show you the details of this corrupt bargain, so-called corrupt bargain of 1824, um, and have you decide whether or not it's at all what, like what President Trump is claiming right now. So a couple of things to know about 1824, a new party system emerges. Instead of the Federalists and the Democrats, we now have the Democrats versus uh, the, what becomes the Whigs and the Republicans. Um, it sets the stage for Jackson's victory in 1828. So he loses in 24, but he wins in 28. Uh, and it ushers in this new period of reform, which we'll talk about. Now, some detail, 1824. Okay, Jackson, all these kind of democracy trends are happening. And what happens in 1824, four Republicans uh, run for office. And they all kind of have basic sectional support from different parts of the country. They're, some are more popular in different parts of the country. So um, one is William Crawford, and he's popular in the Southeast. Another one is Henry Clay. He's popular in the Northwest, kind of this area here. Uh, we have Andrew Jackson, who's popular everywhere but New England. And then we have John Quincy Adams, who's popular in New England and New York. So these four guys run, and because there's four of them, they kind of split the vote. Nobody gets a majority. Now, Jackson wins the popular vote. Uh, if you took every, all the total numbers of people voting, Jackson got the most out of everybody. However, nobody got a majority in the Electoral College, even uh, Jackson. And as you guys know, the Electoral College is what determines the actual presidency. So in the papers, people read the newspaper. Andrew Jackson wins the popular vote. He gets more votes than all these people, right? But he's not, uh, because there's a split, he doesn't get a majority of electoral votes. So what happens is, it goes to the, the way the Constitution says is the election goes to the House of Representatives. If nobody gets a majority in the House of, uh, in the Electoral College, it goes to the House of Representatives. And here's where it gets kind of dicey and where Andrew Jackson gets bitter and angry. So what, you, what happens is, is the House of Representatives takes the top three vote getters, and then th from those three, they pick the president. Now, the, one of the, t the top three was uh, William Crawford, John Quincy Adams, and Andrew Jackson. Now, William, Craw the other guy was um, Henry Clay. He's actually the fourth runner up, so he's out. All right. Now, William Crawford has a stroke by just luck of you know nature or whatever, has a stroke, so he's out. And it's between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. Now remember, Jackson wins the popular vote. He gets more votes than anybody else, except he it's not how the president works, presidency works. Uh, it's now between these two guys in the House of Representatives. Now, Henry Clay, 
all right, is the Speaker of the House. He's in charge of the operation, okay? Now he's out of the bargain, he can't appoint himself president. But what it does is the House of Representatives votes um, as, as a group to decide who the next president will be. Now what happens is, is with Henry Clay's support, and um, John Quincy Adams becomes the president. He's picked by the House of Representatives to be the next president. Uh, and this is a lot of it because Clay did a lot of wheeling and dealing in the House of Representatives. Immediately after John Quincy Adams, you know, wins the election in the House of Representatives, he appoints John Quincy Adams as Secretary of State. And at that time, if you were Secretary of State, that was often considered like an on-deck circle for the presidency. And uh, Jackson's followers feel ir outraged that, that Henry Clay maneuvered to get John Quincy Adams to be president in the House of Representatives. And then John Quincy Adams supposedly rewards him with a Secretary of State. Now, is this a corrupt bargain? I don't know, but the Jacksonians argued that it was. This was totally corrupt. We've been robbed, the people have been robbed, and Jacksonians and his followers are ready to seek vengeance. And for the next four years, they, they basically wage a campaign to make Jackson the president in 1828. Um, you hear a lot of this right now about President Trump saying the election was stolen, there's fraudulent votes, and his, this has been robbed. Now, what we do know about today in 2020 is that there, real, there has been no evidence of any kind of fraud. Even President Trump has not found actual evidence of this uh, and his followers. Um, now, and again, there's no actual evidence that in 1824 there was a corrupt bargain. Um, you could argue that this does look kind of bad. However, um, Henry Clay and, and John Quincy Adams tended to agree on most policies. They both had a lot of experience, so they, it wouldn't be totally shocking that they would support each other or that Henry Clay would be Secretary of State. Um, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> and the Jacksonians are, are angry that this uh, these, these two kind of Washington insiders made, made a deal and their guy who won the popular vote uh, is not president. And just so for all of John Quincy Adams' um, presidency, his four years of presidency, he has a really, really hard time because he is a minority principal. He does not, he only won like a third of the popular vote, right? He didn't actually win the popular vote. People are angry that, not, not everybody, but a chunk of the population is angry that he became president. Now he has very high-minded kind of New England principles. He's a New England Puritan. He's very stubborn personality wise. He had what many considered kind of aristocratic airs, sort of like an upper class sort of way about him. Uh, he was very much like the Federalists of, of his father's generation, uh, but he was very well prepared, probably the most prepared president we've ever had. He was at like age 14, he was like working in the Prussian ministry in foreign affairs. I mean, this guy knew what he was doing. His dad was the president, right? Um, but like I said, he only got a third of the popular vote. So he's wildly unpopular, more two thirds of the country voted for somebody else, many of whom voted for Jackson, right? So every step Jack, uh, John Quincy Adams made, Jackson supporters opposed every single one of those moves, right? Uh, and in 1828, Jackson runs as a hero of the people, the man of the people. Um, and they, you know, he even, they, his supporters came up with the nickname for him, Old Hickory, which was his old war name from when he was a general. And so this kind of gave him the kind of average common man hero. And on this, he ends up winning uh, the 1828 election. And we have for the first time kind of this, this guy who came from our humble beginnings, uh, who wasn't afraid to not talk the kind of Washington talk. And, you know, basically said he was going to clean up the house and make uh, all these old um, elite people from Washington leave and usher in the average man running the country. Um, and the proposed cure for the people's problems, all right, were to expand democratic rights, to redirect the economy towards the little guy, uh, to make more and cheaper land available for white settlers. Now, this is clear. These are white settlers. And in fact, one way you make more land cheap and available is you get rid of the Indians who are in the way. All right. And so uh, the other thing he was going to do was to get rid of these big banks, not all banks, but he hated banks, Jackson did. So if somehow try to find relief from those people who are lending you money, creditors, speculators, and banks. Um, now, this is what's going to have uh, major economic repercussions. It's going to wreak havoc on the economy. But he says, look, I'm going to, we're going to get rid of, we're going to attack these banks, we're going to attack these speculators so the average person can get some relief. Um, and so it's with this that Jackson gets elected. Now, how did Jackson become president? Well, more and more people uh, end up suffering in society. They find themselves without a vote. So there's a movement to get more votes to the average person. So when more and more average white, even poor white people can vote, white men can vote, a guy like Jackson who says, I'm going to get the rich, we're going to get rid of those other people who are in your way, uh, he becomes the hero of the people and he becomes the president. Um, and so we're going to see how this plays out in the next couple of classes. But we have to understand Jacksonian democracy that put Jackson in place. All right. I hope this helped. We'll see you in class soon.